Economic Development Commissioner Joe, Joan Goldstein because I want to talk about the importance of making investments that will help strengthen and grow the economy in regions across the state. This year, I proposed to the legislature a $100 million package to help support our communities, spur growth, and make sure employers who are harmed by the pandemic can stay on their feet and support their employees. For years, I've talked about the need to grow the economy and make Vermont more affordable. The federal money, as well as the significant budget surpluses, truly give us a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to take transformative steps forward, which is why I keep talking about it. This was a comprehensive package with the initiatives working together to have the greatest impact. A couple weeks ago, we focused on housing, which we all know we need more of. But in order to accomplish that, I've also proposed tens of millions for sewer, water, and stormwater, which is necessary in order to build more housing in many of our downtowns and village centers. Along with that, we need good paying jobs in strong, safe, and vibrant communities as well, which is why we must also invest in economic development. Commissioner Goldstein will go through the specifics of each, but my plan would devote eight or 30 million for a grand list enhancement program, which will help grow and develop areas of the state which need it most. I've also asked for 50 million in capital investments and this is a program to help small businesses and nonprofits survive, recover, and grow, and increase economic activity across the state. Among the many initiatives is a $20 million business assistance program to create loans for businesses. This is the Vermont version of the federal PPP loans. This will focus on sectors hit hard by the pandemic, like hospitality, agriculture, and the arts. I've also asked for expedited permitting for these investments so we can put the money to work as fast as possible, which is important because the feds require us to spend it within a certain number of years. Unfortunately, the House didn't include this $100 million package in the budget they passed a week and a half ago, saying the Senate would cover economic development. The problem is, just like housing, they didn't budget for it and spent the money on other things, which makes the House pass budget out of balance. So if the Senate decides to include these important investments in their budget, they'll be forced to cut the House's proposals. To be clear, the Senate is working on an economic development bill. But like the housing bill they're also working on, they've included provisions I vetoed in the past. So again, just as I said with housing, let's put aside the areas of disagreement and pass clean bills that can, we can all support. That's what Vermonters expect from us and not the games we see in Washington. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Goldstein. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> Good afternoon. and. Um, just want to reiterate, as the governor mentioned, Vermont is face to face with a great opportunity to infuse federal dollars into economic development throughout the state. In the proposal, we laid out where we think more than $100 million should be invested and will deliver great benefit to all Vermonters, our communities, and the small businesses that are the heartbeat of the economy. At this point in the legislative session, as the governor said, the budget that passed the House included zero dollars for these initiatives. Zero dollars to help Vermont employers and employees recover from the pandemic and grow in the years ahead. Zero dollars to invest in the improvements of our towns to aid in a strong recovery, as well as to recruit new workers to, new, uh, to businesses to our cities uh, and towns in the future. It is very disappointing that out of over $100 million in proposed economic development initiatives, zero were allocated by the House, leaving the Senate with the tough job of deciding where to find the funding for these important programs. As the governor referenced, the budget had a few areas utilizing both ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act funds, as well as general fund surplus funds. 
The capital investment program would bring additional funding to a program that's already underway. Last session, we were approved of $10.5 million, uh, and we received over 100 applications with more than $90 million worth of requests. What this tells me is that there are plans in the future to grow Vermont, and some of these will be worthy of the recovery funds, and we are going through that now. The proposed investments, some examples are childcare facilities, performing arts venues, museums, food supply chain improvements, uh, and hospitality projects, as well as supporting small businesses like restaurants and breweries. Working in tandem with capital investment program is something we call grand list enhancement program. And in order to enhance grand list, typically it's a capital investment. So that program would support the municipalities who need help to stabilize or expand their tax base. We had the tax department look up that more than half the towns in Vermont have a stagnating or declining grand list, which really means we're not adding to the pie. We're not adding to the um, base uh, from which we could collect taxation. That money would help facilitate development or redevelopment of commercial properties or multi-unit residential, which we so, so sorely need. Um, in these communities, and we could use these communities as a target area to, in which to enlist the funds. The, um, the, the importance of that is the grand list value, as that increases, we share the burden. The tax burden gets shared by more properties, by more people, and the quality of our, our life and vitality in each of these communities would be enhanced. Another $20 million was what we're calling the Forgivable Loan Program. The Vermont Economic Development Authority would administer that program. So there are still businesses suffering from cash constraints from the pandemic. It doesn't really take a lot of analysis to understand that a performing arts venue that's been closed you know, off and on over the last two years is not going to have the revenue and the cash flow that they had prior to the pandemic. So in order to meet the needs of those types of businesses, Vita would issue a loan to help those entities cover short-term expenses. And if they used it, according to the ARPA rule, it would be forgiven. And then on to the general fund asks. We, this is an unprecedented labor shortage out there. You can't really speak to an employer without them talking about the inability to find labor. And the governor had asked for $6 million for the new worker incentive so that we could help businesses recruit people um, who want to move to Vermont. And so we, we need that desperately. We also wanted to create a recruitment marketing and relocation network so that when people do hear about this incentive program and call us, we have local people in the, you know, in the local communities around the state that could help them network for jobs or for housing or for just the social fabric of the town. Um, the shortage of residents really, it, it impacts everything from tax rates to school funding to businesses not operating at full capacity. We had a food producer recently tell us they could only operate at about 75% capacity. That does not a good business make, nor does it speak well for the you know, future of the prosperity of the economy. The other ask we had in general fund was $6 million in brownfields. And to give you a sample of what that means, uh, last year we were appropriated $10 million. We've already allocated about five to 14 different projects. And what that does is it cleans up polluted land and buildings so that some future development could occur. So for example, these projects are cleaning up 17 contaminated acres, creating 490 jobs and 202 units of housing and 80 new hotel rooms. So um, think about what we could do if millions more were invested in economic development, projects, jobs, housing, new business, new green spaces, and revitalized communities can flourish. I want to say one more time, the general lack of development in Vermont over the years has led to our housing supply shortage and the inability to grow uh, the tax base in so many of our towns. COVID has spent two years continuing to harm development and damaging the financial stability of some of our most important sectors, including arts and culture, travel and tourism, agriculture, and small locally owned businesses. ARPA has given us the resources to bring historic development projects to every corner of the state, continuing to ensure our business community has the support they need in the short term and also to 
uh, bring about some bold new investments to continue to, to yield into the future. Let's use these funds as they were intended and return economic development initiatives to the state budget. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting with folks in the room. Governor, you talked about the contractor and the rental registry bills that were in the housing bill. Specifically, which bill is in the Senate economic package that you vetoed prior? Um, there, there's some provisions within the bill, uh, like the minimum wage. Uh, I think that was one, one area. There's some other areas uh, within that bill that are problematic. If changes aren't made to the House's budget and the Senate moves along with the House's recommendations, would you veto the budget? A lot of, a lot of ifs there. I have a long ways to go. Uh, I'd like to give a path forward. Uh, if they look at some of the veto letters, uh, for instance, uh, with the rental registry uh, and the contract registry, if they look at the veto letters, they see a path forward where they can have what they want and I can, uh, I can protect Vermont as well. So. Um, if they can just adhere to that, and that's a start, that's, that's, that's my uh, line in the sand, so to speak, um, we'll be okay. Um, but, um, but they have to be willing to make that step. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by a grand list enhancement program? Yeah, I'll let, uh, uh, I'll let uh, Commissioner Goldstein talk about this a little bit more. But, but as we know, um, just making, you know, providing for capital investment in, in buildings, uh, dilapidated structures, and so forth, uh, gives us a lot of different uh, positive things. Uh, one being, uh, you know, fixing up the structure enhances the, the value of the building, providing more uh, enhancement to the grand list uh, and more taxable income. Uh, but it also provides for more housing and so forth, which we desperately need. Yeah, the, the governor did a nice job of answering that. I think that thing to bear in mind on grand list enhancement would be that it is utilizing ARPA funds, so any project would have to meet the final ARPA rule. However, if it's from a town within that has had a stagnating grand list, we would give preference to that. But basically, the more the more properties you have on your tax roll, the, be the better off. Governor, I'm wondering if you could sort of put this issue that you've identified in perspective for us as you send a message to legislative leaders. Is this, hey folks, we got a problem we have to work out here, or is this, we got a problem here, uh, this thing needs to be figured out in order for us to go forward. Can you just sort of put that in perspective it's for us? A, a little bit of both, right? I mean, we have an opportunity right now. It's uh, the House pass budget, for instance, as I said, is unbalanced. Um, and it's not as though um, some of the initiatives within the House uh, budget are, are all problematic. It's just some of them are. And you're going, the Senate is now going to have to make choices because I, I believe even the House agrees we need some economic proposals. They've said, they told me, that the Senate was going to take care of that. That was their agreement. The Senate's going to take care of economic development and maybe some housing as well. But that money has to come from somewhere. Um, it's not an endless, um, endless pit here. Um, we we need uh, to be, um, we need to be realistic uh, about uh, the amount of money we have to spend. And so again, they spent the money. They didn't put a placeholder in the budget saying uh, so much for economic development. They just went and spent it on other things, which puts the Senate in a somewhat difficult position because they're going to have to make cuts in order to do that. So. Again, I think the message is a little bit of both. We have a problem here, and we, and we have an opportunity to fix it. But if it goes much further, then it's going to be uh, the extra emphasis you'd put on it. We have a real problem. If the Senate passes it in the same manner, then we have a real problem. The U.S. Congress is also looking at an enhanced program right now for restaurants, hospitality, have you had a chance to look at that and see how that would affect Vermont? No, I've heard that, but again, as we've seen, I don't know if we can count on Washington at this point. Um, there's been, for instance, uh, the Build Back Better uh, plan. Uh, it doesn't seem like it has any legs at this point. 
Uh, even the COVID dollars that the president wanted has been cut in half, and uh, much of that is going to come from reallocations from money not spent from the state. So I, uh, I think we need to, again, move forward with our proposals and, uh, and because I'm not sure that we can count on them. Commissioner Levine isn't here, but you know it, it seems that COVID cases are ticking up slightly, um, and self-reported tests. I think those are, are also ticking up over the next few weeks or over the past few weeks. I guess what what is your assessment right now of, of where we we are with this virus? And it, it's not surprising. I think uh, I've talked about this in the past. Dr. Levine has talked about this as well. Um, the expectation wasn't that COVID was going to disappear. COVID is here to stay for a while, and uh, we just need to learn how to manage it. And from the very beginning, it was about managing our health care system. Um, so thus far, uh, I think we're, uh, we're not surprised by uh, any slight increase, uh, but at the same time, it's fairly flat. Uh, and uh, so I think we're doing okay. I've heard from a lot of people on the COVID question uh, that they feel like they're getting a mixed message from the administration about the second COVID booster. Uh, on one hand, from Washington or the CDC, they're saying, they're hearing, hey, this is actually a pretty good idea for folks over 50. But is that really the message from the state health department? Is there so, sort of a mixed message here? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to refer to Dr. Levine when he returns um, and uh, let him answer that. But uh, but again, I'm in that boat, right? So I'm contemplating whether I should or not. Uh, and it's not necessary. Uh, it does have, uh, seems like a shelf life, so to speak. And, uh, and I'm going to determine whether I have mine now or wait till maybe later in the, in the summer, fall, uh, so I'm better protected when we come back indoors. So I, I, the message I'm hearing is um, that uh, if, there's no harm in having it, um, but in most cases, it's not necessary at this point in time. That's what I'm hearing. But I'll let Dr. Levine answer that first. So you, personally, you would wait uh, for a couple of months because you think you would have better protection in the fall? Yeah, Is that I mean, and thinking? that's when we typically, I mean, right now, I think cases in the U.S. are, are flat, um, and, and I don't see the need. I, I'm pretty well protected right now. And if I did uh, happen to get COVID, it's fairly mild from what I've seen thus far. So um, I would, I probably will wait a bit, but it's not to say that I shouldn't, because maybe I could have another one then, but I just don't know what's going to happen then. I also have a question. The, uh, the House Education Committee is looking at several different revenue sources to fund the universal school breakfast and, and lunch program. I think there's a sales tax on candy as a possibility. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to go through the list? Well, I, 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 you probably know the list better than I do. Uh, <laughs> they're, all, they're all the same. No, no, and no. I mean, in this time of unprecedented budget surpluses, this is the last, this, this is the last resort. I mean, we don't, we're not going to increase taxes now. Um, that makes no sense to me at all. Um, not at this point. I mean, you have to make choices. I mean, we all have to make choices. I mean, it's priorities. You know, it comes down to that want and need that we all go through individually in our own households. Do we really want it? Do we need it? Or do we just want it? And we have to prioritize that. But to increase taxes right now, uh, I think I think most Vermonters would. <laughs> not, not understand that at all. I don't understand it. Again, we've had two years of budget surpluses and we're an upgrade in the allocation for next year in terms of the money we're going to spend um, and a budget surplus in the ed, ed fund. It just, again, it doesn't pass the straight face test. Phones, 
Sid? All right, we'll move to Greg Lamoureux, County Courier. Okay, we'll try Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Well, thank you very much. I am here. Um, Governor, I had a couple of questions. One was uh, for, for Dr. Levine, or perhaps Dr. Kelso could answer it. But uh, on the question about the um, the small business loans, the PPP type financing you're thinking of, there was a, there was a lot of um, discussion and angst actually amongst very small businesses in the PPP because it was some question about whether it was going to be taxed as income, whether it was a, a straight loan or a grant, how, how are you um, uh, thinking about this, this I, process for this, this money? You don't want Dr. Kelso to answer that, do you? No, 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 I have a different, I have a separate, a separate question. But if she does have an answer, then we could give it a, give it a shot. Hi, Tim, it's Joan. Um, yeah, the, this will work like the PPP, but it'll be a little bit more flexible than PPP, so uh, provided it really acts more like a grant if the applicant pays for the expenses as outlined in the rule, which are basically any operating expenses. So it'll act like a grant, and as such, grants are typically taxable. So, is it is there um, uh, lim em employment limits or something like that that will be? Uh, no, not, th not that uh, I'm aware. I think we wanted to make it even more flexible than PPP. Uh, PPP, I think, had a predominant um, impact. You, you needed to spend most of it on payroll. This will be really any operating expense of, of the um, entity. So that's, we proposed it specifically that Vita would administer it so that they could analyze each and every business's uh, particular situation. One formula really doesn't fit all. So. Okay. All right. I'll look forward to that. So, Governor, the uh, the health question I had was was a little disconcerting. I, I uh, we talked to someone um, from out of state yesterday, and as you as you may know, my youngest son has Down syndrome, and this this family has um, a son, a teenager with Down syndrome, also has uh, also other condi health conditions, and uh, including a heart murmur, and they weren't going to get him vaccinated and said that their doctors and Dr. Fauci were recommending against it. And this was uh, a head scratcher to me. And there's a lot of other people that are obviously have, have um, uh, children with um, health conditions who, who are in the same position. So I was wondering about um, that. That's not how I understand the recommend the health recommendations either here or from Dr. Fauci. Yeah, um, I don't know if Dr. Kelso can answer that or not. If not, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to wait for Dr. Levine's return. But he uh, he could get back to you uh, in the next day or so, Tim. He'll be back, I think, tonight or tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Kelso, okay. do you have uh, any response to that? Yeah, that's not much easier than a PPP question for me. <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's certainly... Uh, uh, clinical and patient, doctor-patient discussion that needs to happen um, at an individual level that we would not make a statement that would apply to every person with Down syndrome or a heart murmur. Um, those folks should be talking to their own health care providers about what's best for them, given their health condition. As, as, do you know if Dr. Um, uh, Fauci has, has weighed in on, on this sort of thing? Not to my knowledge. Okay. All right. Well, I look forward to hearing from Dr. Levine if he has any, anything else to add to that. Thank you very much. We'll have him give you a call. Thank you. Guy Page from On Daily Chronicle. Governor, Maine and Massachusetts are starting to see repeated robberies of legal marijuana stores, some suspicion that the cartels are behind them, in order to snuff out the competition. Are Vermont law enforcement leaders, uh, I, I see that uh, Commissioner Sherling is on the line, um, are, are the, you or are they aware of this potential problem of yet another drug crime group uh, targeting Vermont in a new way? 
Um, I would I would just say that there are a lot of cash businesses uh, out there that are susceptible to any of this to crime, and uh, we do our very best to protect each and every one of them. Um, but I uh, I don't know if this is on the radar of uh, law enforcement or not. But I'd ask Commissioner Sherling if he has a response. Good afternoon. No, uh, uh, the governor's general response actually is uh, right on point. Um, you know, safety measures for, for all businesses, uh, particularly ones that deal in, in cash, are, are essential. Uh, nothing specific to Vermont on the radar. Of course, uh, our retail uh, cannabis industry is not yet functioning. So if and when any uh, intelligence or information came our way, we'd certainly share that with uh, the affected businesses. Okay, thank you. Uh, Governor, you're the chief executive of an enterprise that includes the Vermont Commission on Women and other groups established to benefit women. How would you answer the question, what is a woman? I, yeah, I haven't contemplated an answer to that. Are you getting, are you saying that it, at, the, at these, during these times, um, that not everyone wants to designate as a male or female? Is that what you're referring to? Well, I, I guess that's kind of what I'm getting at. I know that our Supreme Court Justice nominee was asked that and couldn't answer, and there does seem to be some confusion over, or at least perhaps unwillingness to define uh, what exactly a, a woman is. Well, I think anyone who's on the Vermont Commission on Women, uh, I, I just assume uh, that they refer to them as uh, as her, she or her. So I think we're okay there, um, but um, but maybe that needs some consideration in the future. I just, I just don't know. I haven't contemplated that, but I haven't heard any uh, outcry from the commission or commissioner uh, of that, uh, of that uh, entity. So until, until such time, I, I guess I'm not going to be too concerned about that. Thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. All right, we'll try Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Tom or Chris? Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Quiet group today. You're not doing very well, Jason. <laughs> Colin Flanders, seven days. Hi, thanks, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, Governor, I just wanted to see if we could get an update. Have you come any closer to deciding whether you're going to run again um, later this year? Um, no, I'm not ready to announce anything at this point in time, but I, uh, I did make a commitment. I'd do so before by the end of the session. And if they adhere to, I think they had targeted March or May 6th. So it'll be sometime between now and then. Okay, thanks. And the other thing I wanted to ask, um, I know the last time you used one of these press conferences to talk about the housing bills and in particular the, the registry proposals that you still are unsupportive of, the response from lawmakers was that they feel like they've, they've given you enough. Um, they feel like you should come over, to, you should essentially compromise. They just wanted to get your reaction to that. They feel like they've, they've gone far enough where the bills now represent something you should support. Just want to get your reaction to that. I guess we feel um, we, we have a mutual feeling on opposite ends of the spectrum. I, I vetoed uh, the contractor registry and the rental registry because I don't think we need either. Um, so that was my starting point, but I did put a path forward uh, for acceptance, and um, they haven't met that standard, at least with the rental registry that I know of. Uh, the contractor registry, they're getting much, much closer. 
Thanks. Aaron Patenko, Vermont Digger. Hi. Um, last week, uh, you know, Dad French um, spoke out in opposition to school districts setting their own mask policies. Um, I, uh, I hear now that the CDC has reversed course on putting three Vermont counties on the high risk um, level of the COVID map. Um, but I think the question kind of still remains about what school districts might decide to do going forward if, um, you know, cases and hospitalizations continue to rise. I was wondering if you kind of had any final thoughts to add on, um, you know, whether you believe that school districts should be allowed to put their own policy and also um, what barometers or metrics are you going to use going forward to measure whether things like the school mask mandate or the general mask recommendation could or should be re-implemented given that we have, you know, a sh shifting testing strategy that's affecting COVID case reporting. We have, you know, reportedly a lot of hospitalizations that may be COVID related or not COVID related. People are just testing positive in the hospital. Um, how do we know if we are in another surge? Well, again, we, from the beginning, we've looked at hospitalizations as uh, the metric that we use because it's the most consistent. So we'll probably, uh, I, I don't see any reason uh, to reverse course on that uh, since we've been doing that for two years. Um, Secretary French, anything you want to add in terms of uh, school and schools and guidance? Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, you know, just the general recommendation, which has been consistent throughout the pandemic, is that, you know, districts should defer to Department of Health and these issues. And, uh, you know, my my point, the superintendent, wasn't so much about local decision making. It was just a strong recommendation that they defer to Department of Health. I think, you know, the county by county sort of approach that CDC has been promulgating might sort of work at a national level where counties are much larger. Uh, but I think, you know, that kind of approach leads to more volatility in a small state like Vermont. And this is not a moment when we need that kind of volatility in our decision making. So, you know, again, um, I think it's important that school districts uh, do defer to the Department of Health when they're making their local recommendations. Um, and, you know, the Department of Health has been very successful in, in formulating those recommendations throughout the pandemic. Um, okay. Are there any kind of specific tracking that you're doing at a regional level for whether schools or pediatric cases are rising in certain districts or certain counties? You know, we follow the, all the data very closely, um, but again, it hasn't been about specific metrics. It's really about the trends. Uh, so we, we continue to have regular updates on the data, including the regional data. Um, but again, the Department of Health has always taken a very measured approach in that regard. and. Uh, right now, we still think the trends are, are very manageable with the recommendations that we have in place. Okay. Um, this might be more of a question for uh, maybe Dr. Kelso, but it appears that the self-reported antigen tests um, rose significantly this week. Uh, there was also kind of an increase uh, last time those metrics were released. I was wondering if um, in the, uh, you know, testing kit giveaway that you guys do through the state run sites. Um, if there are specific instructions or parameters that you guys give out to, with those antigen tests that might be influencing that self-reporting. Governor, would you like me to wait? Yes, Dr. Kelso, please. Thank you. Um, I first wanted to point out, you said the CDC reversed course in designating certain counties as high risk. Um, I wouldn't characterize it that way. CDC recalculates those county level um, community metrics on a weekly basis and the data showed that, you know, the, the risks were at lower levels. And um, we know that we, the Vermont Department of Health and state government and CDC know that with at-home tests being used more frequently, we are less reliant on case reporting to assess levels of 
virus activity and that's why the community levels were developed because they factor in case reporting but also hospitalization. Um, you are correct that the number of at-home tests that are reported to the health department has ticked up. It was um, two weeks ago, it was 247 positive, last week 421, and this week 516. So it reflects what we think we're seeing through other data that COVID is still around, um, the risk is not zero, and yet while we're, we're seeing perhaps an uptick in cases, we're not seeing the same thing happen with hospitalizations. And we know hospitalizations are a lagging indicator and we know we need to keep our eye on that. But given that BA2 has been in Vermont for a number of weeks and we've not seen a significant uptick, I'm hopeful that while COVID is still around, we won't see a dramatic surge and we won't see an increase in hospitalizations to the point that strains the healthcare system. Okay, that's all, thank and you very much. And oh, I'm sorry, sorry your, your specific question about instructions that we give out at the testing sites. I believe that from the beginning, the at-home tests um, have been accompanied by a little card that says you can self-report these results on the health department website. And I don't think there's been any change in that. All right, thank you. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Um, I'm hearing from community members who are concerned that our access to um, PCR as well as the rapid and lamp tests that are being handed out. By our local health care center, which is an affiliate of CVMC, which is an affiliate, affiliate of UVMC, um, is not able to provide either boosters or testing. So it's leaving some of the people here in the Mad River Valley feeling potentially stranded in terms of access to vaccines as well as ongoing testing, whether it's PCR or rapid testing. What does the state, how does the state plan to address that for our community, but also for other communities in the state? Secretary Samuelson, are you on by any chance? And I would I would welcome um, Deputy Commissioner Doherty or uh, Dr. Kelso to also weigh in here. So you know I can look into the specific um, situation in the Mad River Valley, but generally the te the opportunity for testing continues across the state. We simply began we've begun the process to uh, hand out um, rapid take home tests versus reducing actual access at testing sites. Um, the goal here in, the, in providing rapid tests is to give individuals um, testing opportunities so that they can determine the results immediately, given the more recent strains of the virus uh, where um, they are more highly transmissible, it's really important for individuals to have rapid results. Um, and so again, we've, we have been committed to ensuring um, continued access to testing across the state, but also um, transitioning over from, uh, from PCR to rapid tests in many locations. In addition to that, there's been a wide array of testing that has become available through local pharmacies um, and other options um, across the state. And I think that we will continue to see that as a, a long-term and ongoing strategy for individuals. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that we've had um, local testing throughout the winter here. And most recently on those local testing days, people are offered the choice of either four rapid tests or um, one lamp test. But there is still a need. I had a parent call my offices this morning looking for me to lead her to a lamp test because her child wasn't allowed in daycare today and she needed to work. And I can't, could not pull one out of my hat because I don't have one. Um, so there's concern that this child needed the lamp test before he could be let back into daycare. So I'm just hoping people will have access to enough of this testing. Will the state be offering any further mail, mailed at-home tests? 
At this, at this point, we don't have a plan to offer additional um, mail-in tests, but again, uh, we do have sites across the state. I'm happy to talk with you offline about specific areas of the state um, that you feel are, are missing options. Um, so far, we, uh, we are, you know, we've got pretty wide distribution. So again, happy to talk about a specific situation um, offline to see if there's an, an issue to address. But uh, uh, tests do continue to be available, LAMP tests, antigen tests, and PCR tests across the state at testing sites. Okay, thank you. Um, who is your spokesperson? To whom should I reach out? Uh, you can reach out uh, to, to uh, Will Terry. Okay, thank you very much. That's it for me. That's it? Okay. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again next week.